Well, um, I guess you are the icing on the cake. I don't know if your <laughs> I don't know if your ears were burning earlier, but we've been talking about you f for uh, three hours more or less. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. It's a great honor, and um, I want I will not introduce Jeff because the whole point of the interview is actually for him to introduce himself, in a sense. So, I will start actually by asking you to state your full name. Is it Jeff or Jeffrey? Uh, okay. You know, it really is so nice to see so many uh, familiar faces again uh, today. But uh, in my real name is Jeffrey, and my middle name is Lynn, L-Y-N-N. And uh, I, you know, I asked my mother, you know, why I have that name, and she told me that there was an actor from York, Pennsylvania, called Jeffrey Lynn. Oh, well. And uh, but I never, I never liked the Jeffrey so much. So I eventually just kind of dropped it. I didn't officially drop it, but uh, I just started to go by Jeff. <laughs> and uh, exact birthday? Uh, uh, January twenty first, nineteen fifty five. And York, Pennsylvania. Uh, York, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, what is the first? I don't want to do it too much like a talk show, but I'm taking this <laughs> opportunity. What is seriously though? What is the first thing you remember about York, Pennsylvania, in your life? Not the first thing that comes to mind, but what? Mm -hmm. What is your first childhood memory of? Uh... Uh, well, I remember, you know, the home that I grew up in and uh, where we lived in York. Uh, it was around an area of York suburban. Uh, that was the name of the, uh, the high school there. And I lived on a road called Southern Road. I went to kindergarten uh, right beside uh, the school. It was called uh, Valley View uh, Kindergarten. And uh, one of my fond memories, they had a little art shed there that I would go to as a child. We moved away when I was four. So you know, my memories would have been around age three, four, going to this little wooden shed and uh, having little art projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he has a place in the mythology around you and your work, this house shaped like a shoe, no? That it's mm -hmm. in York, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you see it or do you want to talk about it? It's a sort of fairy tale mm -hmm. house shaped as a shoe. And is it the house of a shoemaker or? Uh, it was a house of a shoemaker. I think the shoemaker was Hanover Shoes. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, in the shape of a shoe, like 50s fantasy uh, type architecture, but this was probably made uh, actually in the 40s. And uh, it actually has uh, two bedrooms, a living room, a, a dining room. At the present moment, uh, I think they're serving ice cream out of this uh, shoe house. But uh, that uh, shoe house inspired me to make pieces like Puppy and Split Rocker, uh, to make some structures that had a sense of shelter about them and um, an aspect of fantasy architecture. Um, we looked at it earlier uh, when um, Jeffrey and Linda were talking about your work. We looked at your picture from the new Jeff Coombs. No? And that's at what age, more or less? Uh, uh, four. Four. Yeah. I, I've looked at that image so many times and so many times even wonder if it's really you because it's so you know, as often with you, it's so much you that it's got to be a joke, you know. <laughs> it's, when, when it, it's an experience I have also with your work that is so perfected to a level of Jeff Kuhn's <laughs> that you wonder if he is... Uh, also, Calvin was saying it earlier, you start wondering, are you serious? And in, in, in that image, there is also this paradox of something so sincere that you start doubting it. So... Um, when and how was that picture taken? Jeffrey observed that you are holding the um, crayon with your right hand and you are instead left-handed and that made me realize it might not be you in that picture. It's just a <laughs> generic American boy that, uh, that stands for a dream of uh, America. So, uh, you know, I don't recall anybody ever trying to change me. My parents never tried to uh, change the hand that I use. But uh, that was my uh, kindergarten uh, photograph. Uh, from this uh, school, Valley View uh, Kindergarten. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a setup that they had. They had that uh, coloring book and the crayons there, and you would just, you know, sit there and be photographed. But uh, my work, I am sincere about my work. There's a sincerity and a, 
uh, romanticism that I have uh, with the work. Um, when I thought about using uh, that photograph, the new Jeff Koons in my work, I thought that I was displaying uh, integrity and openness and excitement uh, about the world. And uh, uh, it seemed to me that I uh, had the essence of, a, that I had a future, you know, that I was open to the world. Uh, it is one of my favorite works in the sense also that um, it shows the way in which you understood that yourself could be almost a tool of your work uh, or a medium in itself. No? You famously also shaped your own body to appear in a certain way to remain in heaven. Uh, and um, the idea of packaging is uh, something you have often referred to when speaking about personality. There is a beautiful interview you did with uh, David Sylvester, and you say something uh, both uh, frightening and exciting. You say that uh, we live surrounded by images that are packaged, and that puts a tremendous pressure on us to be packaged, and that you think your work should provide the opportunity for people to package themselves as they want. Uh, so it's both an idea of freedom, but also still an idea of packaging. And, uh, and in that same interview, you talk about having milk and cereal and looking at the package of the cereal box and having a kind of a sexual Freudian experience because the milk is actually a memory of your mother and the cereal box becomes a stand-in for your mother, um, which first of all should you know, make us run to the psychoanalyst right away, but it's also a, a, a fantastic and creepy image also of American affluence. And uh, um, so did you ever think consciously, and let's think also of the art ads, and that you would construct yourself to appear in a certain way? I, I, in other words, are you packaging yourself? When you're speaking about the cereal boxes, yeah. you know, I, uh, I've continued to think about cereal boxes. And uh, more recently, I understand uh, one of the things I enjoyed so much about them, and even today, is a lot of packaging uses gradations. And a gradation, when you have something from a, a dark go to a light, but and these gradations are really uh, referencing uh, the sky, sunrise and sunset. We're, so we're very familiar with gradations. So it's depicting time. And so it uh, functions as a, a metaphysical uh, device. And I think that's really what always pulled me to be captivated by the cereal box that it's uh, referencing time. Um, I, I want to still dwell a little bit in childhood memories. Uh, I asked you this also for in, th in the interview in the book. When do you have a memory of your first encounter with Duchamp's work? Um, as you know, the majority of the works of Marcel Duchamp are in the collection of the Philadelphia Art Museum, and uh, which, how far was Philadelphia from York, or how frequently would you visit it? Um, Philadelphia was about 90 miles, so uh, it takes about a little less than two hours to get there uh, today, but when I was a child, about three hours. And my uh, father's sister lived there, my Aunt Erna. And uh, one of the most uh, moving events I had, it, it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't going to the Philadelphia Museum, even though she took me there. And I probably would have seen a Duchamp work, but it, it didn't register the young age. But she took me to the top of City Hall to experience uh, Alexander Calder's grandfather's sculpture of William Penn. And it's a 75 foot tall bronze sculpture. The city halls probably, I would estimate, it used to be the highest structure in uh, Philadelphia, maybe it's about 35 stories up, uh, where they would have uh, William Penn sitting on top of this uh, kind of dome shape. And it was so moving to, to be able to go to the observation deck and it was like, uh, no, uh, going through uh, a Jules Verne type of uh, uh, novel of uh, the architecture, the portholes, the steel beams and rivets going up to uh, uh, the top of City Hall, going up the elevator shaft. And you, you would it'd be like going to the uh, journey to the center of the earth or going to the moon. And you would look up and you'd have such a visceral experience looking at this tall sculpture of William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania and feel the connection to the community, the historic community, uh, at the base of City Hall, Philadelphia. And that was very moving to me, and uh, because it had awe and wonderment, 
and at the same time this uh, this linkage this sense of of family and uh, uh, having uh, be able to have experiences but still feel uh, a connection and do you have any later memory of artworks at the Philadelphia Art Museum either by Duchamp or others that stuck with you I mean as I as I got older of course I would uh, enjoy seeing Atondone and the large glass, uh, Jasper Johns' beer cans, and uh, uh, also the Poussin. The Poussin's uh, amazing. Uh, it's the triumph of, uh, uh, not Neptune, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's one of the triumph paintings, a woman with a, like a Venus with uh, some of the horses and uh, coming out of the ocean. And I know you have recalled this story but it's just impossible not to bring it up, of your encounter with Salvador Dali. You know, often you have said that you have come to Marcel Duchamp through Dali, in a sense. And um, I was thinking yesterday that only you would have the ability to cold call the reception of uh, the St. Regis and get through to Salvador Dali. You know, it's, uh, I guess it was a precautious demonstration you would have a talent as a, a future stock <laughs> exchange employee that you can just call somebody up and but do you want to talk a little bit about your encounter with uh, Salvador Dali and how that developed um, uh, sure so uh, you know my mother was the, the first person and father to buy me a book on Salvador Dali's work as a Christmas present one time but uh, my mother uh, read in a magazine that uh, Dali spends half his year at the St. Regis Hotel and she said you know uh, look, he's, he's in New York half the time. So I thought, well, I'll call him up. And so I called the hotel and I asked for uh, Mr. Salvador Dali and they put me through to his room. And uh, so he, he answered the phone and I, I, I told him that I was a young artist and uh, I was at the, at the time I was 18, I was at the Maryland Institute College of Art, but uh, I told him that I really uh, enjoyed his uh, work and that I would like to meet him. And he said, well, you know, if you come up this Saturday afternoon, I'll meet you in the lobby at 12 o'clock. And I, I told him I'd be there. And exactly at 12 o'clock, he showed up. And uh, he came down, he had a big, it was in the fall time, probably in, the, I think it was November, maybe it was January, but he had a very large buffalo fur coat on. You may have seen photographs already of this coat. And he had a diamond uh, tie tack uh, type of, pin and his silver cane and uh, he had his mustache up and uh, he informed me that he had an exhibition at the Nodler Gallery and if I'd like to see it uh, that he'd meet me there so I, I told him I'd love to so uh, I went to the gallery and uh, when he was there he was with a, a French journalist he had said told me that he had to meet a French journalist there and he was walking around later years I realized that I think it's a, a mandolier <laughs> That, uh, that he actually was walking around with because she was very tall and long blonde hair and they're really kind of very intimate going around looking at the works. And uh, then uh, he came up to me and he asked me that if he would, I'd like to take his photograph. And I said, sure. So uh, he let me take his photograph in front of the head of a royal tiger. And if you stand back like 50 feet, I think the title's a hallucinogenic head uh, with uh, three heads of Lenin or something. And uh, I was sh shifting my camera around a little bit, and he, you know, put his mustache up, really <laughs> getting back into a pose. And he said, "Come on, kid, I can't hold this pose all day," and uh, putting it up. But you know, he's really uh, generous. And in just talking about Dolly right now, you know, we know, we know the relationship that uh, Duchamp uh, also had with Dolly, and I think that uh, Duchamp probably picked up also on the uh, generous quality of Dali. Uh, actually, there is a very nice anecdote that Calvin Tompkins refers about the relationship between um, uh, Dali and Duchamp, that uh, apparently Duchamp was the only person that had a kind of soothing effect on Dali. You know, Dali would become much more modest in his presence. And uh, when uh, Calvin was writing the profile about Duchamp, Duchamp told him he should write about Salvador Dali. And uh, first of all, Calvin says he was kind of surprised by the generosity of an artist who, you know, in the process of being written about, would actually point to another artist. And he asked him why, and he said, because he's the biggest ego of the 20th century. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> That's good. And for an artist who was somewhat modest, yeah. like uh, like Duchamp, he either envied or admired mm. that um, egotistic position. Um, this leads me to two questions. One is um, that admiration for Dali resulted in um, in direct works. Did it result in the way also you think of the, the public persona of the artist? Or, uh, or what did he, how do you think that trickled down in your own life or in your own work? You know, and maybe I, get, I can go back because you asked me about this idea of using self in the work. Uh, when I've used myself in my work, I've always uh, really kind of done it at the service of my work uh, to try to bring uh, across context the, the way I was viewing the work. It really wasn't for uh, an egoism of the self. It was to try to incorporate and create a context that the work could be looked at. Uh, the art magazines were trying to present uh, what some of the ambitions were of, uh, of the work. Uh, but it's really always been for uh, uh, for the work and not for uh, uh, the self. Uh, the, and the other question was if you f can say, um, you know, what did uh, of Salvador Dali rub off yeah. on you or, or on your own work? Uh, and did you keep thinking, I mean, you have done throughout your work, uh, throughout your career, uh, you have painted or made reference to Dali mm -hmm. on multiple occasions. Mm -hmm. I, I always loved Dada and surrealism, and I remember that evening going back to uh, uh, home. Back, uh, that uh, you know, this this could be a way of life. That uh, you know, maybe I can do this too, and be part of some type of avant-garde, and just make my work all the time. So, th just through that generosity of being available, just to be there as a human being that's also an artist and performing these things. So that's what really had an impact. Dali's work had an impact. I mean, I always enjoyed the paintings and, uh, and also uh, it served as a vehicle to start a journey to go inward and learn uh, how to create personal iconography and have an inward journey. I think surrealism and Dada as a whole uh, helped the whole 20th century have the ability to take kind of an inward journey and then uh, we learned a little bit how to move outward, and pop is kind of a reflection of that. And you often say that your encounter, more constructive encounter with Duchamp, happened when you started working at the Museum of Modern Art, not with his work, that you could spend time, mm -hmm. um, and which coincides also in the moment in which you stop painting, stop the kind of more surrealist work, and you start experimenting with the inflatables and um, what you have called objective art. I knew about Duchamp's work and in, in art history at Merrill Institute, College of Art. Uh, uh, Bo Davis was one of my instructors and he would speak a lot about Marcel's work. But when I went to the School of the Art Institute and I started to befriend people like Ed Paschke, who was a mentor to me, Ed would uh, you know, take me, I was his studio assistant on the weekends, and you know, after lunch he would say, you know, you know, let's, uh, let me take you and show you some of my source material. And he'd take me around, show me some tattoo parlors, or uh, take me to some clubs and say, see the lighting there? Look, you know, look the way the light's flickering off that curtain, the sequence, you know? And he just opened up this uh, uh, area of the ready-made and how everything's kind of around us in the world uh, just by showing me a source material. And the Chicago images as, as a whole were, uh, you know, very open to just everyday life images. Uh, to incorporate into their work. And, uh, but do you remember when working at, the, at MoMA, do you have a clear memory of looking at Duchamp's works and which works yeah. and uh, yeah. what did you take yeah. from it? Uh, Massimiliano, you know, after a while I, I moved to New York then and when I come to New York I'm starting to hang out with people that uh, also uh, have a European background of fluxus and uh, understanding of Duchamp's work more from a European uh, perspective. Alan Jones, the uh, writer and critic, was a close friend of mine and would speak to me a lot about uh, Duchamp. And working at the Modern, I would have the opportunity to go and see his work and go into the library. And MoMA also had the uh, architecture design department and they were presenting objects. And I would go and I would look at all the different objects there. And I wanted to, I loved the idea of the ready-made. I loved the, the minimalism of the ready-made because of coming out of... Um, 
coming out of Dada and surrealism and the Chicago type of imagist work, I wanted to get away from kind of an inner self or uh, you know, what uh, an artist thought about or um, of their own experience. I felt I, I didn't want to get caught up into like a fetishism of using personal iconography just to keep going around the circle, but that it to, to go outward into the world. And so the type of minimalism that the ready-made presented seemed to distance oneself from one's own sexuality or one's own, uh, um, uh, I guess in a way, uh, I'm gonna use the word past here, but it would uh, just be kind of a break for me. Yeah. Uh, as you know, the, one of the, the premises of the exhibition here in Mexico City, it's a little note by Marcel Duchamp that he writes in, in 1913, but gets published much later, in which he talks about the question of shop windows. And he says that the shop windows hide coitus behind the sheet of glass. And uh, um, there is plenty of glass in your work. You know, I joke that we go from the large glass to the plexiglass of your um, Hoover series. Um, but there is also a kind of romance of the city, you know, in both the work of Duchamp, the early Paris uh, the, as capital of the 20th century, and then New York. And uh, so I'm curious about what the city felt to you like. We heard from Linda and Jeffrey a little bit about New York in the 70s or 80s. There is a fantastic snippet on YouTube that I really recommend everybody to see of a strange interview between you and David Byrne. Um, privately, I would like to know if you were completely stoned in that video because you look um, very strange. <laughs> and you talk about the curtains in... Uh, but I'm curious actually if you can give us a sense of um, uh, what the city felt like to you. Um, there is also one of your first, let's say, traumatic experience in New York because you first make it as an artist, but then you have to go home because you're out of money, no? Uh, so yeah. do you want to talk a little bit? I think it's also relevant, yeah. you know, when we think of cities like Mexico City, you sure. know, to, to find exactly. a way for the person in the metropolis. You know, I came from a, a rural area, Pennsylvania, and so I went, uh, when I went to art school, I moved to Baltimore, and Baltimore at the time was the 11th largest uh, city in the United States. And then when I moved from Baltimore, I transferred to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, Chicago was the uh, third largest city in the United States at the time. And then I, I moved to New York, and it was the largest. So it was kind of a progression, progression steps for me. But I loved just walking around uh, the streets of New York. And, uh, you know, I was just opening myself up and creating kind of different narratives, because whatever I would find my interest uh, to be, I would just kind of focus on that, and I would start looking for that, and then that would connect to something else. Maybe I would be you know, thinking about basketballs, and that would connect me that I'd all of a sudden see a Nike poster, and say, oh, well, that's a siren, you know? And that uh, the basketball's an ultimate state of being, an equilibrium tank, and the Nike poster's a siren. Then I'd walk down the street and see, a snorkel and think, no, wait, this is maybe a tool for equilibrium. And then see an aqualung and realize, oh, that's really a heavy duty tool. It's kind of a bit like the Venus of Wellendorf that this is really about, has a tie to history, it's metaphysical, it deals also with the past. And so uh, these type of connections would take place walking around the city. I loved Orchard Street, uh, Delancey Street, 14th Street was my favorite. I mean, uh, Anybody that knew uh, 14th Street then, uh, you know, there was a large Spanish uh, influence on 14th Street, and uh, it was colorful and festive, and uh, uh, I, I was moved by the uh, the type of imagery, the directness of the uh, the imagery. You say that the furthest uptown you went was 26th Street in those years. Uh, yeah, and, and 26th Street was where I bought my first inflatables, uh -huh. uh, my inflatable flowers and... Uh, uh, but yes, that was about as far. Uh, you know, sometimes you'd make a trip, of course, and go to uh, to, to a museum. But as far as uh, being on the streets and really looking in storeroom windows and uh, uh, shopping, it was really uh, below 26th Street. 
I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but you already alluded to it, speaking of the Equilibrium show, <clears throat> which is 1985, right? And uh, luxury and degradation is 86, or? Uh, that's uh, luxury degradation is 86. 86. Okay. And those are, um, to me, some of the capital exhibitions, particularly in understanding how you confront the um, legacy of the ready-made. Uh, and... Uh, um, Jim Lewis at the time, who I believe writes the catalog essay for your San Francisco SF MoMA show, which is, what, 89 or around then, um, he uh, says something quite beautiful. He says that uh, the ready-made for Duchamp is a, an object that is asking itself, who am I? And your objects instead are asking, who am I for or who wants me? Um, and that's a... a, a important shift that also help us understand the ready-made differently that to me uh, the revelation of that uh, quote by Jim Lewis is that the ready-made is not just a philosophical uh, masturbation about what is art and what is not it's also a reflection on taste and class you know? who can buy what and for which reasons and uh, the moment you buy something that defines you as an individual and um, uh, as I was working on this show, I kept thinking of my parents, you know, if I go to their house, they have certain things that they bought that represent them as people. And probably, you know, if my child look at my house, he understands I buy certain things um, which express who I am. And, uh, and I think that's what those two shows um, bring forward in your work. And uh, I don't know if you want to talk about uh, some of those shows, in a sense, were more political than people understand today. You know, the, uh, even the rabbit and um, they were all declarations about state and uh, about taste and about class more than, than anything. You know, for me, uh, Massimiliano, I work very intuitively. So when I started to work with ready mades, it would have been in 19... Um, 77 and I had an apartment over on 5th Street and I was still painting because I always studied painting when I was in uh, uh, art school and I was making a very large uh, painting it was kind of like a mound a large breast covered with uh, uh, some artificial leopard skin it had a silver or no gold reflective uh, top on it and it got so heavy that I had to take it off the wall and put it on a table and when I put it on the table, I also attached a porcelain figurine of, of a woman. It was a, a Spanish figurine. And then on the second kind of level of the table, I put a, a little uh, planter with some deer. And I put two inflatables. One on one side, it was an elephant. And one on the other side was a panda bear. And that was my first sculpture. And it was... Uh, just again intuitive that starting to want to uh, make things that went outside the self when I was in Chicago right before moving to New York I remember uh, having dreams where I would fall down and I couldn't get back up and it would be like my legs would just give out and uh, and that started I started to become fearful that this was going to happen in real life and I'd start to walk down the hall maybe at school and start to feel the same thing and I had some dreams that were uh, kind of out-of-body type experiences. And uh, so there was a really a strong desire for me to start to work more objective and to, uh, you know, work uh, externally, uh, deal with things outside, have this interface, uh, you know, um, not just uh, an internal, but to have also have this interface with the outside world. And so then I started to uh, buy mirrors. I would buy store-bought mirrors because I really loved Smithson's work and Robert Morris. I was really moved by minimalism and uh, other works that were uh, taking place in uh, New York. And uh, so I bought these store-bought mirrors and I would just place these inflatables on them. And I would be so moved by the intense sexual quality of it that when you walk by, you see the reflection of like, this inflatable flower and the color of it there. And uh, it's like a different time. You have the, the right here, right now, but there's also a little different time taking place and such an enheightenment of, of the color. Uh, then I would have to, I'd have to go have a beer, get drunk, and I'd go to Slugger Ann's where Jackie Curtis would be tending bar. And uh, 
it was an intensity about it. So it was really very much for me this intuitive process of developing, in a way, a sense of personal iconography, dealing with uh, intensity of feelings and emotions, but at the same time that they were starting to lead to ideas. Uh, the ideas wouldn't come first, they would lead to uh, meaning. And with luxury, luxury and degradation, you also start revisiting, in a sense, your, your origin, no? The, the portable bar that we have in the show, you have spoken about how uh, it actually belonged to your parents, and your parents were so proud of taking a bar with them when they went on holidays. Um, in other occasions, later on, maybe for banality, you spoke about these little objects that were in the house with which you had a kind of erotic experience, like ashtrays and... Uh, um, so how was this uh, sort of rediscovery of your origin taking place through your work? Okay. And what did it stand for? Okay. So, uh, so the development of my work, after you know, working with these inflatables, I started doing the new, encasing vacuum cleaners, showing these objects for their newness. And uh, whenever I'd be working with um, a ready-made object, I'd always be trying to maintain every perfection or imperfection of that object. Uh, it was like to maintain the essence of the, uh, the object. And so after making the, uh, the encased vacuum cleaner pieces, which were really, for me, about the gestalt of who's really better prepared to survive, uh, you know, an, or an organism that's organic or a machine, uh, and that the machine had its most integrity when it was born, not being used, and that the individual has to participate uh, uh, for uh, integrity. And uh, I thought that the work was maybe being looked at constantly within kind of the framework of the 50s America consumerism. So I wanted to show something that would free it from that. So I created Equilibrium. And I wanted it more biological. I didn't want to have to keep cleaning all these cases and being sure uh, everything was, you know, uh, pristine, and I wanted more uh, freedom. So, uh, and I wanted to play with time, so I made the Equilibrium uh, series. And uh, for me, that was a very moral series. And I remember reading some of the first reviews about it, and people were writing about that it had kind of an immoral quality to it. And for me, I was really uh, trying to communicate that it's about going for it. It's not about any end result or any end object or, it, life's about going for it. That all the Nike po uh, posters, all those sirens telling you to go for equilibrium, you can achieve it, uh, uh, you know, I've achieved it, you can achieve it too. That's what the sirens were saying, that uh, they were deceiving. They were deceivers that, uh, you know, it's in impossible to achieve it, and it's about going for it. And I really thought of them as contemporary artists, uh, uh, that those Nike uh, uh, basketball players were. And I went on to luxury degradation, and I, the idea of the shiny object, I, I started working with stainless steel and luxury degradation because I had a friend that became an alcoholic. And I saw the degradation set in, and I heard the babble and the abstraction of the babble. And I wanted to make uh, work that was uh, dealt with abstraction and dealt with kind of the responsibility of the abstraction. Art is a really powerful medium, and you can really communicate through that uh, medium. But at the same time, I wanted to communicate how powerful it is to people and let them know to, that they uh, shouldn't fall for, uh, for uh, luxury, uh, be deceived by luxury, and uh, to maintain their economical and uh, political power, not to seek luxury, and to give an understanding of abstraction. The higher you go up in the economic ladder within luxury degradation, the heavier levels of abstraction are uh, laid upon you to eventually just come in and take all your economic and uh, political power. Uh, that was the kind of the, the message, but I used a material of stainless steel. It's a proletariat material. I mean, if we had to, you could melt it down and make a spoon out of it or a pot in a pan. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, sterling silver. It wasn't platinum. Uh, the desire was... Uh, to, com to create work that would really uh, uh, communicate about transcendence and about uh, uh, becoming. Uh, that work then leads me to banality. I, I make a piece called, I don't want to just keep going here, but eventually I make a piece called Kip and Curl. And uh, I'll stop here and you can... Well, you know. uh, both in your own trajectory and also in historical trajectory, the, 
Um, so luxury and degradation is 86, and the rabbit is 86. Um, and then 1987 is the you know, crash of the market in America and the recession. Um, in a sense, you know, the rabbit, uh, had it been timed maybe just a few months later, uh, he would have no longer worked in a, you know, in a post-crash economy. No? He has become almost a symbol of um, New York in the 80s uh, with all its complexities. Did you feel as a person, as an artist, a, a shift in your life between pre-87 crash and post-87 crash? Or at the same time, you are on your own trajectory to banality and, and later to made in heaven. But did anything change at that moment? Okay. Uh, Mas me, and I just want to bring up uh, the idea about me working on Wall Street. Uh, I always enjoyed being self-reliant. I grew up being uh, self-reliant. I'd go to door. I think some of my first uh, moments of dealing with acceptance was going door to door, selling gift wrapping papers and uh, chocolates and many of the images that you can see at the Humex uh, uh, Museum of my work. And uh, what I always enjoyed was you never knew what the person was going to look like that opened the door. And if they invited you in, what odor would come from inside the home, whether the furniture had plastic coverings on it. or uh, And so this act of kind of acceptance, I first started, I think, to practice that, that I enjoyed uh, interacting with people and an understanding that uh, we both had interests. But so uh, I always supported myself doing uh, artistic jobs, hanging artworks, and doing uh, different uh, jobs like that. And when I moved to New York, I wanted to be a preparator at the Museum of Modern Art. And I couldn't get a job doing that, but I called them every day. They finally said, look, Jeff, we can't make you a preparator, but if you want to work in the ticket booth, you can start tomorrow. And I said, I'm in. And uh, so I started in the ticket booth, and during my breaks, they would let me sit at the membership information desk. And I was a little bored and I realized nobody was really promoting membership. So I started to talk to people when they would come up and they would say, you know, I'm a family member, I'd like to renew it. Instead of just saying, here's the application, fill your name out here. I would say, well, you know, if you move up to, uh, I guess, a, I don't know, a, a patron, whatever the, the term was, uh, not only, you know, it'll be uh, $50 more, but you'll receive over five different uh, books. You'll get the new Cezanne book. You'll get this Warhol book, whatever they were. And I doubled the membership for uh, uh, the, the people coming in the door at the modern to the desk. But uh, it was out of boredom. So people would say, Jeff, you should come and work for me. So I started selling mutual funds. And uh, eventually, I started selling commodities and then stocks and bonds. But I was always a broker. And at night, I'd go home, and I'd be working on my work. And on the weekends, I would be you know, down on Delancey Street and on 14th Street. And it was just a way that I could make enough money to make the encased vacuum cleaner pieces. They cost me about $3,000 each to make. I was able to make enough money to create my Aqualung and my Lifeboat, my Equilibrium series. So I had my independence. I, I didn't need uh, any collectors. And I'm fortunate enough in my life then when people did start to have interest in my work, uh, that I had Ileana Sonnabend come into my life and be really a, a sponsor of my work. And uh, uh, so I was, I feel like part of that uh, end of that golden age mm -hmm. of uh, these galleries in New York. Uh, this is maybe a more difficult question, but um, you know, on one hand, you are a success story, like a beautiful American dream. Um, on the other, throughout your life, there have been moments of crisis. And uh, I mean, you, you're alluding to the fact that you were working on Wall Street to pay for your own production, and most famously in the 90s with Celebration, uh, the, 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 kind of the ground sort of uh, opens under your feet. No? Uh, I think it's Calvin in, in the profile about you. I don't remember if he quotes Anthony Dauphet that says that, um, how is the quote exactly? Jeff is so crazy that we'll make you jump out of the window and then jump out of it too, no? <laughs> how is it that? <laughs> yeah, I'll go with you. <laughs> so, and I mean, that's a great uh, ironic way to describe though a situation of crisis that dragged on for many years. And I, I wanna bring it up because also I think it's important to 
you know, with all the success of the prizes in the auction, people, I think, also perceive your trajectory differently. And in the 90s, there is a, you know, Guggenheim Museum canceling your show because you're not done. Uh, you're unable to deliver the artworks to collectors who have paid for them. Um, and many other also personal uh, situations that, that layer on top of that. But so... Um, I'm able to deliver them. It's just the, the pieces take longer than what originally sometimes uh, I thought that it would. But I'm always making every effort to deliver but them. But it, it did look like a very tough uh, run, no, in that moment. Oh, or with the celebration. With celebration. And the 90s, yeah, yeah. following Made in Heaven. and uh, um, yeah. Well, there are different times that I had to move home. I mean, I would save up and I'd uh, save up enough money to make my vacuum cleaner pieces and then there'd be nobody there to buy them and I'd have to move home and live with my parents. I'd save up enough money, come back to New York, start working in New York again, get another apartment uh, and then uh, go through the same process. I had to move back twice and then I was fortunate that when I did when I made my Equilibrium series I, really, I realized I had no options. I, this is the only thing I could do and I would always be on the phone talking to people like Dr. Richard B. Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner, about equilibrium. And I, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't support myself any other way. And I just had to uh, hope that something would happen that I could just focus on my work uh, all the time. Uh, that's all I've ever really have wanted to do. And uh, that's the, uh, the pleasure that I've been able to have. After that point, there was enough interest and I had uh, the support working with Ileana where Ileana would let me just go make the things that I wanted to make. She was uh, behind those works. And uh, so I was able to just do that. But with celebration, uh, what happened exactly well, in, uh, yesterday actually Jeff was uh, joking about the picture in the exhibition by Man Ray of the large glass full of dust, you know, the, the so-called dust breeding. Um, and he looked at it and he said, people give me a hard time about delivering my work mm -hmm. and look at this guy, it, yeah. it takes 20 years yeah. to yeah. leave unfinished the large glass. So, uh, but, you know, irony aside, I'm, I'm interested, you know, there is also something of a, uh, in an American narrative, not just of the American dream of success, but also of a uh, kind of grandiose, great Gatsby failure in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you felt it that way or... Uh, um, with celebration. With celebration, yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, you were involved with uh, <laughs> celebration. Yeah, maybe we but, should hear his. <laughs> you know, but what, what happened with celebration, you know, I worked with Ileana Sonneben. In, in um, 86, she had a show with uh, uh, what people would call the Neo Geo artists or uh, the, the new type of work. And I was a part of a, uh, this group. And then I started to um, make exhibitions uh, with Ileana. I did the banality show with her. I'd, did uh, the uh, the Made in Heaven show, and uh, you know people started to ask me, well, Jeff, you know you can do these things on your own, and I uh, started to think, well, maybe it'd be nice to do something outside, and so uh, Jeffrey uh, came to me, Max Hetzler, Anthony Dufay, and uh, they said they would sponsor a show, and I started to uh, work on my ideas, and you know what came out of it were these. Uh, uh, ideas for celebration, a balloon dog and a hanging heart, a cat on the clothesline and Play-Doh. And so I, I showed everybody and they were like, wow, this is great. But uh, when I originally talked to them, I wanted to create, a, I said I could create a body of work maybe around a million dollars maximum for all the production. And we realized that this was going to run more. But we were all very excited about the work and then we thought that, well, we'll do pre-sales. And uh, so the complication then of how to make these pieces, because even though they seem very easy when you look at them, a uh, balloon dog, it looks quite simple. But to be able to polish all these curves and concave, convex curves, we had to develop certain machines to do all this work and then to have the type of quality of reflection. Uh, it took more time. And when I originally priced these pieces with a fabricator, uh, they told me, well, you know, we can make a balloon dog for, I believe it was 250 Then uh, they were working on it. Then they came back and they said 360 Then they came back like 750 Then they came back 1.2 And it finally ended that it cost 1.6 
to produce a balloon dog. That's my uh, recollection. That was 1.6. And at uh, 2 million. So uh, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of times I don't make any money on my artwork. My pleasure is to make the artwork. And, you know, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I have no complaints, but, uh, <laughs> no, but, but my, my interest is that artwork. And I, I, it's a moral commitment to me to make the best work I can. If I didn't care, if I didn't care about the viewer, I would knock the stuff out. I would just knock it out. But I care. And the object is just a, is a metaphor for that caring of communication, of uh, our shared interests. Um, so to, to just refresh the memory of some of the, the uh, people in the, in the audience, how long did it take to deliver the first? I remember I used to work at Flash Art around then. And I remember this cover of Flash Art uh, with a balloon dog illustration that was getting delivered to, to its collectors. <laughs> Do you remember, Jeffrey, it was this kind of popular illustration? And was it 99 or 98? Um, uh, we started, or I, know, I think the, the date is 94. I, I showed one of them without any coloring on it. Uh, Eli Broad really wanted to show. Uh, uh, so I showed it, but I believe the first one was maybe finished around 2000, yeah. uh, around that date. Now, other pieces like Play-Doh took, uh, uh, 20 years to make my party hat. Finally, I just finished my party hat this year. And it's such a simple form. You look at it. I started a uh, party hat in uh, 94 and such a, a simple uh, form, but uh, so complex, the engineering of it to make something that's so, uh, looks so simple. It's so complex. Can you explain a little bit how it's, it's the, these are made? Uh, it's because, why do they take so long? Uh, the brim. The brim is a folded loop of stainless steel metal that's polished on the inside and the outside. That's really why it takes so long. And uh, I mean, the whole, the cone is, uh, you know, polished and all that. That's not uh, problematic. It's really the, uh, the looping of the, uh, the brim that goes around. Part of it that slowed it up, not the substantial majority of the time, was that Carlson, one of my fabricators, who told me they were only like a couple months away from being finished, uh, went bankrupt, went out of business. I had to start fabricating uh, uh, the piece again, uh, using some of the pe uh, people from Carlson. Uh, but some complications like that. Uh, but it's basically the form, the brim. Well, the I heard the story about the moon, which is in the show that was meant to be delivered to Daki Sioano. Mm -hmm for a show and he had organized a special flight from New York to Athens, right. which also required to close down which bridge in Manhattan. Yeah. Um, and then you had to cancel the night before, no? Yeah. Because you weren't pleased with the polish of, uh, of I, the piece. Yes, I worked with another uh, uh, company to do that and everybody was really kind of lost. They didn't know how to get these type of uh, forms that didn't uh, have a lot of distortion. And I really didn't want to have any distortion. I really wanted uh, uh, the purity of the, uh, of the form. And why do you, I think that's a crucial question for the exhibition itself. Now the exhibition is about the found object and then Duchamp himself in the 60s turned the found object on its head and has it remade. And then, uh, um, you know, you come along a few years later and you start remaking everyday objects to the point that uh, in the last room of the exhibition you have Hulk, you have lobsters, which look like simple bought, found objects, but they are in fact um, maniacal replicas of reality. And why do you have this urge to make things again and make them so perfect? Um. So going back to the statuary series, uh, after finishing a, a statuary, my uh, foundry in New York, I felt was really just charging too much to make the artworks. And I thought, look, I'll just go to Europe. I'll work with fabricators in Europe. I've had interests recently to work in wood and porcelain. Uh, and so I, I went to Europe and I uh, created the, uh, the Banality Show. But what really led to that show uh, in 87, I was invited to uh, be in an exhibition in Munster, 
and I created the Kipping Curl. And the Kipping Curl is in the exhibition at the Humex Museum. And it's a man coming to a market with a, a, a kip on his back with eggs and potatoes, a hare, tobacco, pigeons. And it's a symbol of self-reliance, of uh, an agrarian culture. And I thought that I'll put this in stainless steel because people feel a sense that their needs are met and that uh, they feel self-sufficient a different way today. And, uh, and I was going and I was seeing a lot of Baroque churches and uh, I would un realize that when you go into a church, you would feel like all your needs were met by uh, the different polarities taking place in the, uh, the church. And when uh, I cast this uh, sculpture, the Kippen Curl, which was a ready-made, of a, a sculpture that was in the town square of Munster, Germany, my foundry banged it up against the wall before it was cooled and it totally def uh, formed the piece, deformed it. So the one leg was too short, a shoulder was collapsed, the ear of the rabbit was practically gone. I mean, the piece was practically destroyed. And I had to decide whether to get out of a major exhibition or to give this piece radical plastic surgery and transform it and to try to make it look like its original self. Everything I always did up to this point was ready-made where every perfection and imperfection of that object was what I maintained that was the essence of that object. But I, I decided to give it the radical plastic surgery. A great steel man came in and would heated up to his white hot and, you know, bend the leg and at weld on something. And we brought the piece back to look like the Kippen Curl. And it was so liberating because I realized that the ready-made that I really cared about and every perfection and imperfection was the viewer and not the object. And so that liberated me. And I think that if there's some things that I can be bringing to the table within the dialogue of the ready-made, it would have maybe started to happen around this time of really realizing that the viewer was the ready-made and that I cared uh, about them and it was, uh, uh, that the object was really just a transponder and uh, the essence was the essence of their own transcendence. Uh, you mentioned religion and we're almost coming to an end, but um, I don't know if you ever visited, and I don't want to say anything inappropriate, but have you ever visited the Virgin of Guadalupe in uh, Mexico City? It's probably the most visited artwork in the world, and it's so visited by I don't know how many millions of people that there is a, a kind of conveyor belt mm -hmm. to move people in front of the image so that you know, more people can go through. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for an artist, and also an artist yes. of your visibility, yeah, yeah. is probably a, a yeah. very interesting experience. Yeah, yes. um, it might be what you know, in a few hundred years will happen to the rabbit mm -hmm. that you have to have a conveyor belt to yeah. move people <laughs> no. through. Uh, so they can see it. No, it's, uh, um, but, uh, you know, throughout your life, you have spoken um, of religion in relation to art. And, you know, as an Italian, I also think I understand what you're saying. Um, and I find it particularly fascinating and also slightly perverse. You know, there is a, you use the Baroque, uh, but then you almost make it into a pagan festival of, uh, or a kind of carnival, now where everything is allowed and... Uh, uh, where good and bad tastes are completely subverted. Um, so first of all, uh, one question is um, about the audience and about the sheer amount of audience. You know, you are probably, uh, you're not, uh, how was the Beatles? He was uh, more famous than Jesus. You're not more famous than Jesus, uh, or maybe you are, but do you, are you thinking about what also this visibility brings to your work? Um, and if he changes it. So that's one question. And on the other hand, if that is somewhat of a religious <laughs> experience. Um. I've always just wanted to participate. I've always wanted to, you know, I've been moved. And I've, my life has been changed by other artists' work. I mean, seeing Manet's uh, Olympia, you know, understanding uh, uh, Duchamp's work, seeing a, a urinal, and realizing that you can just kind of turn everything upside down and people can look at the world completely uh, fresh again. Uh, the uh, connection to the external world, I mean, to be able to have this type of connectivity and dialogue with other artists is what I've always wanted to do. Uh, I love the idea, at least my interpretation of the avant-garde is kind of a, a group of, of people, people who 
see art as an opportunity for them to become and uh, continue to help art become something else, uh, but at the same time connected to a community. Uh, so that's always have been my joy and pleasure. We spoke earlier about generosity, and you know I think that uh, I think artists are generous, and uh, so I feel like I learned how to control my own feelings and emotions through personal iconography, and I could excite myself and stimulate myself, and then I wanted to start to share that with other people, and then you want to start to share information. I I felt that I was able to uh, create in my art something that was not only liberating me, that I could accept myself, my own history, my own being, but I could share that with others, that they could accept their own histories, their own uh, experiences, that everything's about this moment uh, forward. And to try to present situations that uh, help elicit that type of uh, transcendence and to let them know that uh, you know the art is what happens inside them. It's not, uh, it's not that object. That object is really just uh, functioning as uh, something to excite, stimulate, and uh, really be, a, in a way, a metaphor uh, for them. But do you think there is a point in which the number of people also that participate um, almost turn the artwork into something else? And is that a, yeah. per, a, does that excite you or not? I think there is an assumption that you enjoy this sort of hyper-visibility um, of a, a kind of art star, which I'm, you know, I'm not saying that you do, but I'm curious, is that also part of the work, that the audience becomes larger and larger and that um, there is you know, a star quality to, to yourself as a person? I've always wanted to participate, so... I've wanted art to become, art has become larger, the audience has become uh, uh, larger. Uh, with that, there are things that are even, can be more problematic where an audience can, even though they believe that they're kind of participating in art, they may actually uh, not be really open and thinking about things. So if anything, I feel like I've uh, tried to assume more of a responsibility to help try to, to open people up that they truly are having uh, experiences, that they're letting them uh, selves share in what uh, you know the power of art can be by uh, being open to experience, not being in front of things, but actually being closed. I've always wanted to participate. So if the, there's really not an ego that's there that just wants, oh, I want to be big. I would like to uh, be generous. My grandfather was. Uh, uh, county uh, clerk, and he also was a city treasurer in York, and my aunts and uncles, they were merchants. And so I uh, grew up that uh, part of our family was very involved with the community, and I like the idea. I like, what I love about the art world is I think we all really, we want to have experiences, we want to become, we want to have vaster lives, but then we want to share that with others, and that's what's I think why we're, we were here today, because it's not only that we care about our own experiences in life, but we really want to share that with other people. And that's how I define why I've been working uh, with my art on uh, sometimes the platform that I have to share those experiences of, of art. The last question, which is very silly, but if you were to encounter Duchamp as you leave this theater, what would you tell him? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I would say thank you, you know. Uh, I, I would say thank you.